In addition to strength requirements for structural members, we also need to consider the usability or the serviceability conditions. Topics in serviceability include things like crack control, um, vibration analysis, as well as deflections. In this video, we're going to focus on the deflections portion of surface disability. In, in particular, we're going to look at both long-term deflections and short-term deflection requirements by ACI and um, calculations using both current methods and historical methods. So without further ado, let's get started. In addition to limitations on cracking, it is usually necessary to impose certain controls on deflections of members in order to ensure an adequate serviceability limit, um, that deflections don't become too large or too pronounced, that they may be perceived as either you know, being physically unsafe as well as causing actual problems um, in structural behavior. Most often deflections are limited by some sort of code provision, whether it's you know a local building code limiting you know floor beam deflections to L over 360 or roof deflections to L over 240 or, or whatever the, the span limit um, deflection characteristics are. Um, ACI does things a little bit differently and we're going to kind of talk about that in this. Um, excessive deflections uh, may lead to any of the following. Okay, the first one is you know is basically visual appearance. You know, it, it's unpleasant to the eye. Again, it's a perception of something being unsafe. Whether or not that may be true or not doesn't matter. It's just the perception of that. Okay, um, the excessive deflections can lead to damage in non-structural elements. Um, things like cracking of partitions or you know malfunctioning of doors and windows, you know, a door that jams in a building that's older because the house is settled or, you know, shifted a little bit is, is all an issue. Now, there are ways to obviously correct these after the fact, but again, if we can avoid that in the first place, that's a good idea. Um, we also have, you know, disruption of function, you know, for members supporting machinery that, uh, that must be carefully aligned. It's very sensitive to vibration or very sensitive to being out of level, you know, um, poor roof drainage, um, any number of characteristics that can disrupt the function of the element. And then as well as, you know, damage to, you know, both structural and non-structural elements. Um, Things like, you know, if you put like a, a fine stone or marble finish over the top of a beam and the beam below it deflects too much, well, you can get cracking in, you know, in, in, you know, in, the, in the grout joints or across the stone or marble itself, you know. And if, you know, your customer is paying $1,000 a square foot for this fine Italian marble and, you know, you, you design a beam to support it that deflects too much, well, now you've got a huge issue on your hands and we want to try to avoid that at all costs. Okay, now deflections themselves are broken into two categories. We have what we call instantaneous deflections as well as long-term deflections. Okay, and so the instantaneous deflections are the ones that are attributed to the loads that are applied directly to the beam. And so we'll kind of talk about what those are here. Long-term deflections are something related to sustained load or sustained behavior due to things like creep of the concrete material itself. Okay, so we'll start our discussion first off with the instantaneous deflections, okay? Elastic deflections can be expressed in the general form of some deflection value instantaneous. So I'm going to write this as delta i, and that's generally a function of both the loads and the spans and the geometry and the supports, you know, over some EI parameter. Now again, the form of this function changes depending on, you know, the, the type of loading. Is it a cantilever beam? Um, is it a distributed load versus a point load, whatever the case may be, okay? Uh, the fracture rigidity, generally, you know. But this guy, it varies, and there are different ways from your structural analysis class that you, you know, that we can get these, um, get these actual functional values, or you can use a piece of software that will compute the estimated value for your structure, and then we can compare that to some sort of code limit for us there. Okay, some of the more common uh, deflection equations you may recall from your structural analysis class for a simple span uniformly loaded. Okay, the delta max on this occurs at the mid span at L over 2 and has a functional form of 5 over 384 times WL to the fourth over EI. So this is that form. So here's the EI portion and everything else is that function that we're going to kind of look at. And again, it depends on the loading and the span. If I have a point load in the middle of a simply supported beam, the delta max then is 1 over 48 times PL cubed over 3 EI, or sorry, over PL cubed over EI, and so that's, you know, the form for a point load. For a cantilever, 
you know, a point load out at the end of the cantilever, you know, delta max then is one third of PL cubed over EI. So again, it depends on the boundary conditions, it depends on where the load is applied and so forth and so on, how we compute these values. And then there are a whole, you know, you know an infinite number, not infinite, but a large number of other cases that can also be considered. But these, these three by far pop up the, mo um, the most frequently in structural analysis and structural design. So these are actually worth knowing kind of in the back of your head. So that's why I kind of list those here for you. Okay. Okay. Now, the particular problem in reinforced concrete structures is the determination of the flexural rigidity parameter, that EI, if you will, for a member made of steel and concrete with properties and behavior that are widely different from each other. You know, back when we were doing basic mechanics materials, we assumed, you know, EI was constant and it was fairly easy to do. But now when we get into reinforced concrete, now it's a, it's a hybrid of two materials. And so we've got to worry about their interaction. Um, we've talked a little bit about this when we did some of the, you know, the, the cracking um, um, and curvature um, estimates, you know, using I grows versus an I crack. Uh, kind of parameter. Well, this all falls back in line with that kind of behavior. So, so EI becomes kind of an issue and it kind of becomes one of the, the centerpieces of the method that ACI is going to present to us. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of look at, you know, what is the deflection before a beam cracks? Well, if the moment, the maximum moment in a flexural member is so small that the tension stress in the concrete does not exceed the modulus of rupture, and again, we're looking at beam cracking here, okay, no flexural tension cracks will occur, then the deflection is given by the, the, a function that looks like falling. It's that functional form that we had before divided by EC, which is the Young's modulus for concrete, over the gross area, the uncracked area. Okay. All right. So in IG, the formal definition is the gross moment of inertia of the uncracked concrete and transformed area of steel. Okay. If we neglect reinforcement without serious area, IG becomes the moment of inertia of the gross cross section. So if you have a very big concrete block and just a little bit of area of steel, sometimes we can just neglect even the transformed amount of steel. Not always, but you know, it depends on how accurate you want to be, but that's kind of an estimate on these, de these delta calculations. And like other serviceability conditions, you know, if I go into a lab and try to reproduce a deflection or an equation, tests from one to the other will never be the same. They're, they're within a range, but there's you know, no, no set theoretical value that you can re reproduce in the lab just because of the nature of the behavior of the materials. Again, concrete and steel is a hybrid structure and it's you know, neither linear nor elastic nor isotropic nor homogeneous and that violates all of our mechanics and materials assumptions as we start to kind of look at that. So, so this is kind of, there, there's some give and take on this IG thing. So a lot of times I'll just use just the gross area of the perimeter of the cross section and not even worry about the, the transform section uh, contributions. Okay, now at cracking, what happens is we know that the stress, the cracking moment of the section, we can compute that by rearranging our stress formula in which the cracking moment um, at the, the critical section is FR times IG divided by YT, where YT is the distance from the neutral axis to the tension phase. IG is that, that gross section. And so this is right at the point where it starts to crack. You're still using an I gross. Okay, once it cracks, now your I changes because again, we neglect tension and strength. And so your section is starting to become damaged. Okay, and so after post cracking, okay, if the maximum moment, you know, what we call as M sub A and the members exceeds that cracking moment, MCR, then the deflection is calculated using the effective moment of area, effective moment of inertia I sub E as follows, okay, that our deflection is that functional form F over E sub C over I sub E. Now, one of the problems with I sub E is, is that it changes with the load, okay, as I, you know, as the beam first cracks, you know, I have a certain behavior, and then as I increase the load, it cracks a little bit more and your eye changes, your eye effective changes. And then as I keep increasing the load, the eye continues to change as the load continues to change. And so what you'll see is that the ACI provisions have you calculate an effective moment of inertia that is kind of a ratio of your applied moment to that cracking moment value to be able to, to calculate those particular values. Okay, and so, so the effective moment of inertia I sub E you know, for a simple span is given by the ACI equation located in table 24.2.3.5. Okay. For cases where our moment is less than or equal to two thirds of the cracking moment, you just use I gross. Okay. But for all other moment values, we're going to use a slightly different form 
here. And I'm going to see if I can blow this up a little bit so that we can see things a little bit. Um, da -da -da -da. And again, if you have the note packets, it's uh, you can also look this up in the table. Get this thing focused a little bit more. Okay, yeah, it's a little better. Okay, and so what will happen is we will t calculate then this uh, for a case where MA is greater than two thirds of MCR, we're going to take the cracked moment of inertia, ICR, and we're going to divide it by this quantity. And you'll notice that it's one minus the two thirds of the cracking moment divided by MA. So that's a, a percentage, that's a less than one value, okay? Times one minus I cracking to I gross, okay? And that's how you calculate I sub E. The units on this are going to be in inches to the fourth, which is what you would expect out of an I value, but that's how we calculate I sub E, is you calculate that applied moment versus the, the cracking moment. Now again, these are all surface uh, service load values, okay? You're not doing anything ultimate, nothing factored. Everything is basically, you know, your applied moment would be, you know, the moment from dead load plus the moment from live load plus whatever is in the member as you try to calculate this versus what it was doing for the cracking. And you'll see that, you know, as, as that MA number gets bigger and bigger, then this contribution starts to get smaller and smaller as we start to kind of look at it. So that's how we're going to calculate the effective area of this. Okay, now, in this, if we pull this down a little bit and let's back this out just a hair so we can see everything a little too much. There we go. Okay, so IG we said was the moment of inertia of the gross concrete section. ICR, which is sometimes called as I sub T, this is the moment of inertia of the cracked transformed section. So what happens is, is in a beam that was you know, oriented some, that was something like this. Once it cracks, you have to figure out where that neutral axis is, okay? And so then everything that's calculating the moment of inertia is the portion of the concrete that's still in compression plus the contribution of the steel. We neglect everything else in tension around it because the steel is still providing some stiffness to us. And so that's why we need to do a, a transform section on that amount of steel. And so you actually end up with an equivalent concrete block that might look something kind of like that. And again, if you need to review this in your mechanics materials class, take a look at transform sections um, and we can go from there. So, all right, so that's how we do. And then the cracking moment we said was the modulus of rupture FR times IG over YT, where FR is seven and a half root F prime C for flexure. Okay, so that's how all we're gonna do for short term for calculating that I effective. Okay, the long term deflections then are, we're gonna take a look at uh, deflections due to creep and shrinkage effects, okay? The additional long-term deflection, now this isn't additional to any of the deflections that we just calculated for the instantaneous, which comes from the loads being applied, is um, this is due to sustained loads, okay? And we calculate that is that our time-based deflections, or our delta T, if you will, is going to be equal to some lambda sub D value multiplied by this delta I that you calculated before. So the heavier the loads, the larger the long-term deflections, and that's what these sustained loads are doing. Okay, now delta I is the instantaneous uh, deflection and the coefficient lambda is given by ACI 24.2.4.1.1 as this lambda sub delta is equal to some epsilon value one plus 50 times rho prime. Okay, and that's kind of interesting because you've seen this. This rho is a reinforcement ratio and if you remember that prime means that you're looking at the compressive reinforcement. Okay, so any steel that's in compression and this will actually help you with your long-term deflections and we mentioned that when we started talking about doubly reinforced sections so if you need to go back and review doubly reinforced and some of those assumptions and the benefits of putting steel in compression this is one of them okay and so we'll kind of look at how you calculate epsilon and then we'll kind of look at the rest of the formula okay so